Did this wife and mother really pay hitmen with $100,000 worth of cocaine to shoot her husband? Good afternoon everyone and welcome back to my channel and Killer Concepts, the place where we talk about all things true crime. My name is Peyton. Before we get started, please make sure to hit that red subscribe button down below and turn on your post notifications so you do not miss any future content. Also, don't forget that this month is Human Trafficking Awareness Month and if you or anyone you know may think they might be a victim or know a victim, please call the National Human Trafficking Hotline at 1- 888-373-7888. You can also text or live chat. The information for this is down below in the description box. Now, since I did my last two videos on the sad subject of human trafficking, we are going to shift gears this week and talk about a murder. One with a pretty interesting story, actually. I know this topic isn't uplifting either, but we are here for true crime. Today, we will be talking about a woman named Joyce Cohen. She was sentenced to life in prison for the murder of her husband, Stanley Cohen. A prison inmate had come forward and said that Cohen had paid him and two accomplices with $100,000 worth of cocaine to shoot her husband with his own Smith & Weston revolver. We will begin by discussing how Stanley and Joyce Cohen met, and then we will get to the murder itself. Stanley Cohen was much older than Joyce, so we will start with his early life. Stanley Cohen was born in 1934 in Long Island before his father would eventually move the family to Florida. Stanley did well with this change and he would graduate high school and then go on to get his degree in civil engineering at the University of Florida. After he graduated, he would become a manager at a construction company and the construction industry industry is where he would stay and where he would really flourish. In 1963, Stanley would establish his own construction business called SAC Construction Company. This company would go on to be a really successful business for him, especially with the timing of when he established it. At the time his business was getting started, the amount of people moving into Florida was pretty much doubling, which would open many construction opportunities, such as being awarded big contracts to build things like government offices, shopping plazas, and medical centers. With this money, he would eventually begin to invest in real estate as well and real estate development. It, and he also did well in that. The only thing that didn't ever seem to go his way was his relationships, actually. Stanley Cohen had pretty bad luck in Almost all of his marriages, in fact, he had been married several times. He was engaged to marry a fourth wife when he would finally meet a young Joyce Cohen and choose to leave his fiance at the time for her, and this would make her his fourth wife. Now, for a little bit of Joyce's background, Joyce's life was nothing like the fairy tale upbringing and life of Stanley. It was the polar opposite, actually. Joyce Cohen was born in 1951 in Carpentersville. Illinois, which was about an hour outside of Chicago. Both of Joyce's parents had a drinking problem, which led to them having a hard time holding down jobs and in turn money problems. They, they had a hard time making ends meet. Her father would relocate to the south to find a better job as a sharecropper, but not long after, her parents would end up splitting up. And Joyce would live with her mother for a while, but this wouldn't last long as she would eventually end up being made to stay in orphanages and foster homes until she called a break when she was 13 years old and was given the opportunity to move in with her one aunt. Four years later, a 17-year-old Joyce would meet her first husband and father of her son, George McDillon. The two would name their son Sean and they lived in a pretty small house. McDillon was a drywall installer and so he only made a modest wage, enough to provide for his family, but they didn't have a huge amount of spending money. Joyce and George both worked hard at first to take care of Sean and pay the bills, but Joyce would have a hard time living within their means. She would often overspend. This part reminds me 
a lot of Shane Lavera as she had done the same thing and had the same problem. So five years into the couple's marriage, Joyce would convince George to move them to Fort Lauderdale, Florida. George would do this, but it wouldn't take him long to realize that no matter what he did, the amount of money he could provide for his family would never be enough for Joyce. She would never be happy living a more modest lifestyle. So after a year of living in Florida, George would move back home to Illinois. Joyce, now a single mother, would stay in Florida to take care of her kid and would begin working as a secretary to make ends meet. This is how she would meet Stanley Cohen. She was actually working at one of his offices. So Stanley was smitten with Joyce and they quickly started a romance. After all, she was a beautiful woman. The romance moved so quickly that only 10 days after Joyce's divorce was finalized between her and George, she would marry Stanley at a lavish Vegas ceremony on December 5th, 1974. So Joyce was 16 years younger than her husband. With the successful life Stanley had led already, Joyce would find finally be able to start having the things she always wanted in life. She would be able to have the more lavish things now without living beyond her means. The couple lived in Florida for most months out of the year, but during the winter, they would typically travel to their mountain ranch in Steamboat Springs, Colorado. Joyce no longer had to work, and Stanley would even pay for her to take local classes in interior design. Then when she wanted work, Stanley's company would then provide her with plenty of customers to work for. However, Joyce Cohen much preferred shopping to working. Her habits for spending and spending really didn't make much of a dent in Stanley Cohen's pocket though, so it didn't bother him the way it would have when she was with George. However, Stanley had apparently joked to Joyce's son, Sean, on occasion that he thought his mother was going to shop him to death. With this privileged lifestyle would come problems over time. The couple hosted many gatherings for the elite and they loved to party. Lots of money and lots of cocaine. Joyce would soon find out that her husband Stanley had begun having an affair with an old girlfriend actually. When she confronted him about it and threatened to leave, Stanley would allegedly tell her that she would just get absolutely nothing and would have to back to work as a secretary. Joyce Cohen was angry and frustrated, but she stayed with her husband. I am sure she felt like she was stuck in a relationship that she no longer wanted to be in. He wasn't being faithful to her. But she also didn't want to leave her lavish lifestyle. She didn't want to leave behind the new life she was living, the life of money and the life of luxury. She would vent to friends about the situation at times and allegedly told them that she wished Stanley were dead. Others apparently heard her say that she had considered hiring a hitman. The couple would stay together, but things only seemed to get worse. Joyce began to party more and cocaine became more of an addiction than an occasional thing for her. Her son Sean would even develop an addiction and so she would ship him off to boarding school. She thought boarding school would teach him some self-control and discipline, helping him kick the habit. Unsurprisingly though, she really didn't do anything to help herself. So on March 7th, 1986, at around 5 a.m. in the morning, Joyce Cohen would make a call to 911. According to the Los Angeles Times, on the night he was murdered, Stanley Cohen would go to bed as he usually did, naked and alone. After all, the two weren't very friendly with each other any longer. Joyce had stayed up late like usual and apparently heard a loud banging noise as she was sorting through clothes in a downstairs bedroom for a garage sale. This is when she would run upstairs following her Doberman pincher to find her husband, 52-year-old Stanley Cohen, dead with four bullet holes to the back of his head. Now, I do want to mention that other, other reports say three bullet holes. This one says four. She would state to the 911 operator and later to the police that three intruders had broken into the house and then shot her 
her husband. Police would arrive to the Cohen home and they would at first be allowed to check out the crime scene. However, after only an hour of the police being there and really being able to search, Joyce would tell them that they had to leave. Obviously, the police would see this as suspicious because her husband, who she was supposed to love, had just died. Why wouldn't she want the police looking into every possible detail or scrap of evidence that they could find? Basically, Joyce became an immediate suspect in the case. Friends had told police that she wanted a divorce from her husband but didn't want to lose her lifestyle. Police had also found that the alarm system had strangely been turned off. Neighbors reported that they never heard the couple's Doberman mischief bark. Wouldn't he have barked if an intruder had entered the home? Uh, Dobermans are protective dogs. I know we had one. John Marlowe's book Evil Women called out several pieces of evidence being found at the home after the police had provided a search warrant and were able to search the home. So Stanley had been shot in the head with his own Smith & Wesson revolver. The revolver had been found in the ferns outside of their house. Joyce's theory for this was that her husband had went or uh, had carried his gun that day and must have left it out on his end table before he went to sleep and this is when the intruders would get the gun and shoot him with it. Marlo also notes that police had found a tissue that had gunpowder and mucus on it that ended up belonging to Joyce. A witness had also apparently told police that they heard three gunshots around 3 a.m., which is around the time that the medical examiner would determine the time of death was. If this was around 3 a.m., this means that Joyce Cohen had waited two hours to call the police at 5 a.m. Stanley Cohen's children had also believed that Joyce had murdered their father, and they believed it so much that they actually filed a wrongful death suit against her, as well as tried to block her from accessing the estate. In return, she would file a slander suit against the children, but both would eventually be dropped. Even with all the evidence against her, police would wait two and a half years before they would finally charge Joyce Cohen with the 1986 murder of her husband, Stanley Cohen. So she was finally arrested on November 2nd, 1988. It would take a 25-year-old man named Frank Zuccarello a jail member of a home invasion robbery gang to come forward and tell police that he and two accomplices had been hired by Joyce Cohen to kill her husband. Zuccarello would tell police that Joyce Cohen had given him and the two other men her husband's revolver as well as a detailed sketch of the mansion. She allegedly told them that her dog would be put away and locked up and the door would be left unlocked. This is when they would then be able to come in and commit the murder. The most interesting part here, though, would be how the men were paid. According to Zuccarello, the three burglars had been paid with $100,000 worth of cocaine. Joyce would be put on trial, which would last for three and a half weeks. Many witnesses had gone up on the stand to speak against her, including country singer Tanya Tucker, who testified that Joyce had spoken about how dissatisfied she was with her marriage. A construction worker she had reportedly done cocaine with had also taken the stand to say they heard her speak about possibly hiring a hitman. With the witness testimonies, as well as the testimony of Frank Zuccarello, Joyce Cohen's fate was essentially sealed in stone. Her attorneys would try and invalidate Zuccarello's testimony by saying that he was only coming forward with the story to reduce his prison sentence. They would say that the whole thing about Joyce paying him and his accomplices to murder her husband was all fabricated. I do have to admit that paying someone with $100,000 worth of cocaine does sound a little out there, but I also read that it was $100,000 of her inheritance as well, so who really knows which one is 100% accurate. After the little over three-week trial, the jury would find her guilty of first-degree murder of her husband, Stanley Cohen, in November of 1989, and 
she was sentenced to life behind bars. According to the LA Times, I hope I say this right, the prosecutor John Kastronake stated the following during closings, quote, she's a killer. Do not feel sorry for her because she's a woman. She's a cold, calculating murderess who put on a good show for everyone, end quote. So do you think Joyce Cohen committed the murder of her husband, Stanley Cohen? That's what I want to know from you guys. While I think she most likely did, she does look very guilty and had talked about her husband dying multiple times to multiple people. I am also not sure about Zuccarello's testimony. So a couple years after the trial, Joyce would file an appeal that would lay out Zuccarello's testimony and say that it had all been fabricated and there are actually some accounts that back that up. The appeal itself can be found in my sources if you would like to read through it. I'm not going to go over the whole appeal. The Miami New Times says that Frank Zuccarello was offered full immunity in the Cohen case and a good deal for the robberies not information that was previously reported. This can all be found in the appeal. In the appeal, there were also sworn affidavits from Zuccarello's apparent accomplices in the murder. The one man, Anthony Caracillo, had told Channel 10's Gail Bright that he and his partner only entered guilty pleas because they did not want to risk exposure to the death penalty. He also said that they were persuaded to do this because the prosecutor said that if they did not take the deal, they would prosecute them under the RICO Act. This would have had them spending 60 years in prison. The next testimony may be the most interesting, however. When the reporter Gail Bright had finished her interview with Detective Spear from the case and her cameraman was taking extra shots for editing, she asked the officer if he thought the men who were accused really were the killers of Stanley Cohen. According to the Miami New Times, the following occurred. Spear ask referring to the camera. Is that thing off? Hernandez, the cameraman, later recalled that Bright told him then, quote, turn it off turn it off. So he stopped rolling the tape. Once he did, Spear, who was retired in 1995, stunned them with his answer, saying, quote, well, it didn't happen that way, end quote. He reportedly told Bright, quote, what didn't happen that way, she asked. And Spear would respond with, quote, the reason you have all these questions is because we believed all along that Joyce killed her husband, but we didn't have the evidence to back it up, end quote. Right. Quote, so you're telling me that Joyce shot her husband? And Spear responded with yes. Quote, well, are you telling me that those three guys were not there? Is that what you're telling me? Said Bright. And Spear would respond with, that's right, they weren't there. But if you ever tell anybody that, I'll deny it. These statements, which were originally going to be part of Bright's Channel 10 special, would be kept close to her for a while. Journalism ethics told her that they were off the record and she should honor that. But she also should honor that people may have been railroaded into prison. So five years later, she would finally release the statements to Joyce's attorney and they would end up in her appeal. Her attorney, Ross, would file them as new evidence, but prosecutors would say they had a contradicting affidavit from Spear that stated he had never suggested Zuccarello's testimony was fabricated and there was no reason to doubt it. Long story short, the appeal would go nowhere because the testimony of Zuccarello would not be thrown out. There were too many contradicting statements. So I hope that all made sense as I tried to simplify it the best I could. This case has a tremendous amount of information to scour through, including testimonies and a ton of information on the appeal. I just aimed at giving you the most relevant information. So I guess the biggest questions here are, do you think Joyce Cohen killed Stanley Cohen? Do you believe that she killed her husband for his fortune? Do you think she killed him herself? And do you believe that the main witness's testimony could have been fabricated? I just feel like this case leaves so many open-ended questions and there is a woman in jail for the rest of her life for this murder. I do myself think that she is probably guilty. There is a lot of other evidence 
found at the case. Um, most of it's circumstantial, but if you add it up, it does kind of build a story. And she had told a lot of people that she wanted her husband dead. But why would investigators basically convince men to fabricate a witness testimony in order to help jail her. I guess they felt like they didn't have enough evidence. So with that being said, that is all I have for you today. We should have a video next week, but we will see. As I said last time, we are in the process of moving. I haven't changed my background yet, but this weekend I'm going to start taking stuff down. If you have any case suggestions, please send them to killerconceptsvlog at gmail.com and follow me on social media. All the links can be found below in the description box. Please don't forget to hit that red subscribe button down below so that you do not miss any future content. Before you go, just remember that the world's most dangerous minds hide in the most unlikely places. Stay safe.